as you know, looking through the book of Second Peter. And um, Pastor Cobb took us through the first chapter. The mic, you can hear me now? You want to? I can hear. Yeah. It's not loud enough? It's on. I can I can hear the speaker up there. You can you hear? Um they, they they're saying it's a little bit low and I have to speak loudly in it. Yeah, I don't want to do that. Right. So so we've been we've been looking at, at the first chapter. Um ah, first um second Peter is one of those call it contentious books. Um, but before we, we get into the book, I want us to just begin by singing a few songs, a few hymns. Well, I'm a hymn man, so you know, if, if I sing a hymn, I'm able to sing. There's this hymn that all of us know. <coughs> Haven't heard it in a long while, but it's a staple hymn. Hymn number three, four, five, Blessed Assurance. Yes. Old time hymn. I like that one. It was my father's favorite hymn. <coughs> Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. All the day long, this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Amen. You know, this song, as I am singing it, I am sort of, well, sort of amazed, let me use that term, because it is exactly the sentiments of the writer of Second Peter. And you'll see as we go through that this is really what Second Peter is all about. It's about giving us a blessed assurance. Peter wants believers to be secure. 
He wants you to have an assurance that cannot be shaken. And he divides up his treatise in three chapters that we'll, we will dissect. First chapter, of course, is, as you know, because we already went through it, is, is telling us about how to be steadfast and, and what is required for steadfastness. And the second chapter, you'll see, is telling us the impediments to steadfastness. All right? And this song, as, you know, as we just sang it, I'm looking at the words. It says, perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above. Echoes of mercy. Whispers of love. You see, everything is wrapped up in the submission. Third verse, perfect submission again. All is at rest. We cannot be in rest. We cannot rest in Christ without being submitted to Christ. And that's one of the things that will come out in chapter 2 as we go through. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with his goodness. Lost in his love. Um, I wonder if we have, yeah, we have time, can sing another song. Do I have one from the goodly people here or? It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. All right, we know that one. Let me see if I can find this. Um, in the index. You know the number of it? Uh, let me see if I can find it. No, I'm not seeing this here. It's supposed to be in this one, right? Should be in the red one. No? Yeah, it's, it's the red one. I'm looking in here now. And you you can have it you 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 have that one up there? All right, you can put it up there so we can see it. Cause I know the first verse, but I don't know if I remember the second verse. Yeah, there it is. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus and to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know thus says the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood, and in simple faith to Need the healing, cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Yes, it's sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease, just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. How I trust him, how I proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, 
Oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust him. Precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that thou art with me, wilt be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, Precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Father, we thank you again for another evening when we can come into your presence to open your word. Thank you, God, for keeping us. Thank you that we can sing along with the hymn writer this refrain. Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him over and over. God, we know each of us has a testimony of how you have been with us, how you have brought us through all kinds of circumstances, some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood, some through great sorrow, but God gives us song in the night season and all the day long. So we come to give you praise, and we ask, Lord, that you will open our eyes, for we want to see Jesus. Open our ears, for we want to hear what you have to say to us as we delve into your word. We ask for your enlightenment, Holy Spirit, as we do so. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So let us turn to the text, Second Peter, the second chapter. <coughs> It is a, it's a short chapter, so we're going to just read through the chapter so we get the overall gist of it before we settle down on the first few verses. Um, I like when other people read. If I can get, let me see, 22. If I can get four people to read, five chapters each, can I get four volunteers? Five verses each, sorry. <laughs> yes. Chapter 2. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privilege should be, should bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, and bring unto themselves swift destruction and many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of and through covetousness shall they with frame words make merchandise of you Whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, 
and their damnation slumbereth not. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the whole world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Next. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterwards would live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot, who was opposed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. Yet even angels, although they are stronger and more powerful, do not bring slanderous accusations against such beings in the presence of the Lord. But these men blaspheme in matters they do not understand. They are like brute beasts, creatures of instinct, born only to be caught and destroyed. And like beasts, they too will perish. They will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. Their idea of pleasure is to carouse in deep, broad daylight. There are blots and blemishes, reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. With eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They are experts in good and a cursed brood. They have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, son of Bo Beor, who loved the wages of wickedness. Sixteen. But was rebuke for his iniquity, the dumb past speaking with man a voice with man's voice forbid the madness of the prophet. These are well without water cloud that are carried with a tempest to whom the midst of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure to the lust of the flesh, through which one wantonness those that were clean escape from them who live in error. While they promise them, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servant of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome of the same is he bought in bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome the latter end is worse with them than, than the beginning. Next. 
for it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it, turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true prophet says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mud. Thank you. Um, this is a very dire chapter. It's a very stern chapter. It's a very thought-provoking chapter. It's not one that people like to preach from. Because you don't get amen from, pre from preaching from this kind of chapter. It's an essential chapter anyway. Because as I said before, the first chapter gave us the prerequisites for steadfastness to make your calling and election sure. So we, we spent a few weeks on that with Pastor Cav. And now in this chapter, he is moving from telling you about steadfastness to telling you about some of the hindrances to steadfastness. So there are some things that we have to watch for if we are going to be steadfast. And this is his argument. What I would like you to do is to hold your Bible. And if you look at chapter 2, the first verse, in my rendition, it begins with but. Some of you may have, however, it's a conjunction that tells you that it's the continuation of a thought. Although it is the beginning of a new chapter, it's not the beginning of a thought. Okay? So if you want to really get at what Peter is saying, I want you to go two verses up in chapter 1. We're going to read, well, let's read from verse 19 to 21. It says, and so we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. But men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Now, this is what I want you to sort of paste over chapter 2. Because this is what he is making the contrast with. He is contrasting the more sure word of God. Or if you have a, a newer version... The word of God made more sure. He says you will do well to pay heed to it. What? The word. No. He says. But. False prophets also arose among the people. Now the first thing I want you to know from that is. When you're reading a Bible and you say they talk about the people. Even in the New Testament. They're talking about Israel, the people of Israel. In the Old Testament, as we well know, as soon as they came out of Egypt, false prophets arose. Some of them contended with Moses, right? And when they came into the land, it continued. We know about Shaphan and Jeremiah and, you know, we had a lot of false prophets. Now, he is making this point that this is not something that should surprise you. When you say false prophet, you don't say, oh, it's end time. No. False prophets were always among the people. Because Satan don't, you know, is not just taking a rest. Satan is active. 
actively working against the purposes of God. So when God redeems a people, when God calls people, when he sends his word out, Satan is actively seeing whose eyes he can blind and who he can trick. Now, I want to say something about false prophets. He says, just as there will also be false teachers among you. Now, remember, Peter is writing this. This is the last thing Peter writes before his death. And Peter died, oh, 64, 63, 64. So, and this is like months before his death. Peter is looking forward. He looks back to say, hey, there were always false prophets. And then he looks forward to say, there will be false, notice it doesn't say false prophets, right? He's looking forward. He says false teachers. He knows from his experience, that this gift of prophecy that we read of in the book of Acts, and I'm going to make a lot of people angry, that, that the gifts of prophecy that we read of in the book of Acts has been coming to an end. In this new dispensation, the new covenant, God, by his spirit, gave gifts. And then he gave among the gifts, sign gifts. Those are the gifts that the apostles had. And among those was prophecy. New Testament tells us that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. All right? By this time, this prophetic gift has been waning, just like the apostolic gift. When the apostles left, there were no more apostles. Because the apostle of Jesus Christ is appointed by Jesus Christ. And after he appointed those he appointed, he is not appointed anybody else. The apostles and prophets laid the foundation of the church. And the church has, hear Peter say, this sure prophetic word. The prophetic word is not somebody coming to you to tell you that this is what the Lord says. The prophetic word is this written word. Peter said, you will do well to pay attention to this. And then, to juxtaposition against this, he says, false teachers will come. In other words, they're going to give you a different word than what is written. That is the crux of this chapter. It's a vexing chapter. People get real angry at this chapter, but I did not write it. Let me just take myself out of the picture. False teachers. He is looking forward the teaching ministry of the church, and he says, you're going to have false teachers. Now, let me just tell you right off the bat that it's not every false teacher is actually being zeroed in on in this little passage. You can teach something that is false because of error. You cannot know. And nobody is perfect, which is why you must be good Bereans. It doesn't matter who stand up behind the microphone, as long as it's not Jesus Christ. It don't matter who stand up behind the microphone. When you hear what they're saying, you must test it with scripture. If you have a question, you must go on side to them and ask the question. If it is somebody with the teaching ministry of the church, if it is a pastor or an elder, you have a right to have your question answered. Okay? Acts 20 tells us that the duty of the elders is to watch over the sheep. Feed the sheep. And in order to watch over the sheep, those who teach 
must know how to recognize the wolf. Because the wolf don't come as himself. He comes disguised as sheep. And more preferably, as shepherds. Because that's what this is about. It's about false teaching. So, I want to ask you, because it's not a preaching engagement. In your own sphere, have you come across false teaching? Yeah? You come across false teaching? What's the last one you hear about? <laughs> yes. There's only one mic down here. Oh, say another one there. But in the in the week today's what? Wednesday. Wednesday. I think Friday. I was on YouTube. So I was I was watching Gina Jennings talking with somebody you know, like you're going through and you see somebody saying uh, like a debate because I tend to that's my watch. I don't like movies and stuff. And you know, he sounds like he have the truth. Mm. <laughs> So he was debating someone until I noticed in the first part of it, he started to say, oh, you believe in three gods. <laughs> 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 and then, and then, and then I, I didn't know that I, I, I only heard of him. I didn't know like yeah. what he's about. So when he started, I'm like, okay, let me hear what he's saying. And then he off to the guy that is believe in the trinity and it's like, <laughs> just funny but but that's yo him not know him as it it just look like yeah. him know him as it so that's my that's yeah you know it's funny if you if you talk loud and you know have a certain you know posture people think that you really know what you're saying and it's funny to me you don't have to know too much about any language or anything, if you speak English and you can read your English Bible, um, you can see the fallacy um, of what he's saying. He doesn't understand verbs. Um, yeah. Anyway, so, 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 no, this is important to know because you'll be surprised to know how many Jamaicans come to me and say, so what do you think Christians matter about? What do you think about Gina Jennings? I say, he's a heretic. Everybody say, what? I say, of course. He's a Unitarian. He denies the Trinity. He's a heretic. And, and to me, if you get basic doctrine wrong, I have no need to listen for anything else. I walk away. Which is what Peter is getting to hear. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. Um, that the, what you're saying about like the, the shepherd and stuff, the, the, there's an easy way to fall into the trap of substantiating and giving credit to someone thinking that their error is not in the fundamentals, mm -hmm. right? And because obviously he, he has a, a, a long life ministry or so on, and it's going on for, for the longest while. So mm -hmm. you're like, you give him a pass. And that's, that's a thing with, with us, I think, as human beings. For example, if Messi commits a foul, and somebody else commits another foul, then Messi gets a pass, but yeah. the other person don't get a pass. Yes. And we, we kind of, it, it, it's funny, that's, that, uh, that analogy is, is really, seems simple, but that's the thing. We, we give pass to those who, <laughs> who have a preferred position. <laughs> but they're in their they're in the, they're, they're in yeah. fault. And, and I, I want to take that one step further. And we can say that about people we know to be heretic. But I want to say, even among those that we don't know to be heretic, they are sound, we tend to give pass. And we shouldn't. Not because if I am the head of a seminary, and it is a, an erstwhile seminary, and I come in front of you and I say something that don't quite square 
you ought not to just make it pass. You need to come to me after and say, Skip, I hear you say something. Open your Bible and show me how you get this. It's important that we don't afraid of people, you know. Yeah, the authority is not the man. The authority is the word. And, and I want to nail down on this because we're talking about, I don't want to go too fast. I made a statement and I want to justify my statement about this um, prophecy business and profit. Right? Because people seem to think that you go on the internet full of profit. As I said before in some time past, at the last election in the United States, where all the prophets thought, because everybody thought that it was a slam dunk for the Republicans. And when the president lost that election against the runoff play, all the prophets got it wrong. I heard nobody saying, hold on, how come prophet get things wrong? Nobody don't say anything. And then two years pass, and they're back again prophesying now for the next election. I'm saying, what is wrong with people? Eh? I want us to turn to Deuteronomy 13. In Deuteronomy 13, here is what the Lord has to say about this thing. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes true, it comes true, concerning that which he spoke, saying, let us go after other gods whom you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to find out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul. And you shall follow the Lord your God and fear him. You shall keep his commandments, listen to his voice, serve him, cling to him. Now you know that Israel is in covenant with God, with Yahweh. They are in a covenant relationship. They have a moral duty and responsibility to listen only to him. So he's saying, if a prophet come and talk a thing, and the thing come true, but it is leading you away from your covenant God, don't afraid of him, kill him. Get that? All right. Now, this is the one, them, you remember now, the thing come true. The thing come true. And, I, and this is telling us how to judge when we hear people talk. If their soteriology is wrong. If their method of salvation and person and work of Christ is wrong, they are not prophets. Don't fear them. Hold them by the seat of them pants. Kick them out the door. Now turn to the same Deuteronomy chapter 18. I'm going to read from verse 18. The Lord speaking. I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you. Moses is talking. I will put my words in his mouth. He shall speak to them all I command him. And it shall come about that whoever will not listen to my words which he shall speak in my name. I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who shall speak a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he shall speak in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. Now, how do you know when the prophet speak a thing, and how you going to know whether he's a prophet? Two things. If it come true, but it lead you away from Yahweh, kill him. Next one. If him speak a thing and it don't come to pass, don't afraid of that, not a prophet. Deal with him. Those are the two things. That's what it says in verse 22. When he speaks in the name of the Lord, if him come to you telling you Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary and died for our sins, but then him give you prophecy and it does not come true. If him said, this is what the Lord says, 
that thing which the Lord has not spoken, the prophet has spoken presumptuously. Don't be afraid of him. We have people walking around talking about, oh yeah, we're going to hold modern prophets to a different, really. The, God said, I put my words in my prophet mouth. In other words, the prophet is the spokesperson for God. That's why we have Bible. What the prophet speak is what Peter say. The prophetic word made more sure. It is God speaking when the prophet speaks. Therefore, well, we can't, we don't have the authority to do that now. Because we, we are not under the theocracy of Israel. But what we must do is put them out of the church. We must stop entertaining people who besmirch the name of God. Because God is not pleased. When somebody get up and says, thus said the Lord, and is not no Lord, do not entertain them. Put them out. Listen, when you tell people that prophecy finished and people get vexed with you, they don't understand something. If it is God speaking, and I say I'm a prophet, you are charged to obey what I just say, because it is the same as Bible. Yeah, but, but Rich, uh, I think we started preaching to the converted to say, do not entertain them. Mm -hmm. um, I think where we need to go with this discussion is to say um, that we must, and I think you, you, di you did that uh, to an extent, to say, to recognize them and to put up a defense to say, uh, well, not even to put up a defense because... I agree with you, walk away from, especially when they are just fundamentally wrong. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I don't believe this church willfully entertains um, false prophet. Well, I didn't call a church name. I'm yeah, yeah. General. I'm just saying, that's why I say preaching to the converted. Um, but I believe where the crux of the matter is in terms of people in general, church people in general, where the crux of the matter is, is to be frightened for these people who say they are prophets. Well, that is, that is, that is actually the genesis of the, of the discussion. That what we are here for in chapter 2 is discernment, is to be able to identify and so the passage we read is God telling us how to identify, how to identify. So he gives, uh, he gives us two different scenarios because, as you say, somebody can, look, I, I'm telling you all of this because of what people said to me. Somebody come to me and say, well, a man did tell him something and it, it goes up. They don't really care that 20 other things never goes up, right? Something goes up for him and therefore the man is a prophet. And I'm saying, no, he's not. And one of the things that what I'm trying to explain why it is important is because the word of God spoken is the word of God. It is binding. So unless we understand that what you have here as the sure prophetic word, this is what is the sure prophetic word. Don't make anybody come to you with thus said the Lord unless it's square with this. Because you need to say, peace, my brother, peace, my sister, yeah. hold your corners. And, and that is where I, I want us to go with the discussion because um, a, lot, a lot of disruption and disturbances have happened because of that, you know, mm -hmm. in the church where people come and say them get a word. Oh, yeah. You understand? And so, so that is what brings us, to, that's the brass tacks of it in terms of our reality. Mm -hmm. People come in and saying, I get a word for you and this and that and that and, and so forth. Like say, you keep in malice with God mm -hmm. and, and thing like that. So, and you know, people hung, hung their lives on that type of thing of Relying on somebody to get a word for, for, for them. Yeah. 
you know, and not even understanding um, how you can ensure that you are understanding by um, the word of God and his Holy Spirit indwelling you what God's will and purpose is for your life. Yeah, and, and, and it's not even as though nobody can give you advice. No. But the problem is when people say that this is what the Lord says. Yes. And, and we are too frivolous with that kind of thing. We need to be very careful because Peter is now saying, hey, you're going to have people giving you falsehood. It's going to come. It has always been there. And you need to know how to protect yourself from it. And the way, yes. Yeah, I was going to say the way you do it is with the more sure word of prophecy. Right. And my addition is, and I know having, having talked, <laughs> being up there where you are, it's, it's what I find as a deliberating point is that there is a, and if we're honest with, with looking on what exists, it, there's a, you'd call it a, a kind of disunity amongst, like if you ask the question, what is the church? You're obviously going to say there is a splintering of the church. There is not a central point, though we have the central source. If you get what I mean. Yeah. So what you see Peter writing to and the context, he is a part of the development of the foundation of the church. Mm -hmm. So his reference, his letter, which was actually transcribed and shared, was, was like that, that as a reference point. And the collective body, which is a church located in different areas, would reference that, would have counsel, would have a united force that is able to sift through whether a false teacher raised up in their um, immediate local or, or in the culture of the time, the voice that was speaking, the, the, prof, the false prophet's voice that was speaking and so on. They could have argued and confront and so on. But we, I think... Time has elapsed, we have been splintered, and the trouble is how do we hold someone to books that comes up amongst the church or so on? We know that we're operated in this local sphere, but the church is both parochial and universal. Um, so, so that's yeah, it's an interesting question because in the current situation, we are a, a congregational church, and that has for all intents and purposes, some pluses in that regard. It, be, it behoves the congregation, the members, to take this seriously because it is the membership whose duty it is to raise the questions. Because Peter is going to tell us that it, the danger is not the average Joe sitting down in the congregation that gets something wrong. The danger is the one who has the authority, who steps up in the pulpit and then shovels in something with the good stuff, shovels in something that takes you away. That is what he's talking about. That's why he says, teachers, false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies. And I want to really pin down right there because we all know heresy is, is moving away from orthodoxy. And it is any error. But all of us may have error in some way, shape, or form. But that's not really what he's talking about. You have, as I said before, error because of lack of knowledge. I happen to believe, sincerely, that there are congregations, um, church bodies, who for a long time has had erroneous doctrine. And they believe it and they, they do it. But I'm, and, and then we may even see the miraculous growth among those. 
And we will say things like, like I heard at our, um, our, our thing the, um, on Sunday, convention, how, how we have the truth, but we are struggling. Well, well uh, let me tell you something. God, I remember I used to tell me this when I was a young boy, and she'd noticed that the cut of my jib was not straight. And she would say to me, let me tell you something, Richard. You see them friend there? What me see you have? Them not grow up in a no Christian home. Them never hear about Jesus yet. When them do certain things, God wink. God give them a, a bligh. God give them mercy. You see you? The house that you grew up in. Huh? If you farm the fool and follow them, God is going to whip you behind. Well, it's the same thing with church. If you know scripture better than the rest, until you tell people, say, that's how it go. When you deviate, I'm not mean when you make a mistake and somebody call you. When you deviate, and we're going to look at reasons for deviation. God is not going to be smiling at you. He's going to go for the two before. <laughs> and if you find that we are in the position of a two before, that's the reason. And what we need to do, if you find yourself there, or if we find ourselves there, is to go back to the drawing board and say, wheel and come again, start over, Go back to the book and say how we line up. That's what we're supposed to do. It's not the prayer meeting that's going to do it. God said to Israel, who tell you say he can come trample my courts? Eh? Who tell you say he can come sacrifice animals and over long prayers? He said, do you have anything to hear? Do what you're supposed to do. Because you know what you're supposed to do. Do that and then you can come. Yes. Okay, I think one of the problems that we have is that we don't know doctrine. I remember when I was read, we don't know doctrine, or else we would be able to judge what other people are saying using the word of God and what it is that we have been taught. And the doctrine we are taught should be based off the word of God. I remember when I was reading through the Old Testament, a user <coughs> was killed. Because, well, God killed Yuzo mm -hmm. because he went and he touched the ark. In my innocence, I'm saying, what a way, God. Oh, God's a hard man. You know, he said, he said, the cattle them, going go on patrol and the ark of the covenant was going to go drop and everything like that. But then I went back and I, went back and I read again the laws concerning how the ark of the covenant should have been carried. And they put the Ark of the Covenant on an ox cart when the Ark was made with loops mm -hmm. so that you carry poles through it. So the first error was that those in charge did a wrong. And then Uzzah think him helping them. So the fact is that I didn't understand the original reason. So yes. I was upset. Okay. And I incorrectly judge. I'm glad you raised that point. Because, no, it's a, it's a real salient point. And I'm glad you raised it. Because I remember saying, it is not the Joe sitting in the pew that is the real problem. Because when, you're, when we are in the pew, we, want, we, we are waiting to be taught. We sit down there to get the word. The, 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 the argument is with who standing up up here. That is what Peter is talking about. And you are right. Because David and the priesthood, all the Kohathites, whose job it was to carry the ark, they knew they carried it all for the generations through the wilderness and into the land. They knew. But that is what happens here. If somebody says familiarity breeds contempt, you get too familiar with God. God are your brethren. So although God is the one who determines how we approach him, we throw that aside. When we, come, we think that we are so special and God is so lonely that when we turn up here Sunday, God is so pleased to see us. Him don't really care how we do it. Him is so glad. That's what we think. And so Uzzah, although he was 
a Kohathite, and knew better the euphoria of the whole event. The ark is coming back. Everybody jumping up. Everybody getting excited and forgetting the teaching. The ark is to be carried on the poles on the shoulders of the Levite. Don't forget about that. Because everybody happy. And so when the ox cart tilt and the ark will go fall down, Uzzah, being a good priest, don't want it to get dirty. You see, the mistake Uzzah made is that he thought his hands were better than the dirt. We all think so. We are sadly mistaken. The dirt does what God made it to do. The dirt is not in breach of God's law. We are. It is better it fell on the dirt than to put your filthy hands on the ark. And so he died. And we must learn a lesson from that. We don't turn up to worship any way we want to and do it any way we want to because it's grace and God glad. God has rules and God wants his people to know his rules because it is written. Okay? Now, we talk about heresies. And in this text, it says destructive. If you have a King James, damnable heresies. So it's talking about heresies of a special kind. Well, think about that. Think about what kind of deviations affect how we understand salvation. All right. I have a close relative who is a Roman Catholic. And we talk from time to time. And I have to be gentle because, you know, people would say to me, uh, like when I talk to my sister about it, she said to me, well, you know, Roman Catholics believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I say, yeah. And they believe he was born of a virgin. I say, yeah. And they believe he rose again according to scripture on the third day. And I say, yeah. So she said, well, you just have to just deal with them because they are Christians like you. I say, oh, no. Absolutely not. Do you think 500 years ago we had, you know, we call ourselves Protestant and we don't even know why. Do you think that all the reformers went to their deaths because the priests wear a white gown and pastors wear a suit? Do you think that's it? When we say sola scriptura, scripture alone as the governing medium by which the church gets its instructions. And Rome says, no. It is scripture plus the church. Rome says, is the church right the Bible? So the church bigger than the Bible. Therefore, anything that comes from the magisterium, the Pope and his cardinals, is doctrine, is Bible, just like the one you're reading. So they say they have tradition that's not written, only them know it in them head. So after 1,500 years of church life, a pope gets up and says, uh, well, you know, actually, I am infallible. And when I speak, that's Bible. Nobody asks any question. Everybody just say, amen. And then, 300 years later, another pope gets up and says, do you know Mary ascended into heaven bodily? And everybody says, Amen. Why? They have nothing to measure it against. Because even if you don't see it in the Bible, it is in his tradition. And he is higher than the scripture. Because he is the church. And when they say, yes, we agree. Salvation is by grace through faith. We agree. It's just that. When you read their catechisms, grace means something entirely different than what we think. And faith 
is not faith alone. It is faith plus works. Faith plus works. When we read the book of Galatians, all the Judaizers in Galatians in that book did was to add one thing to Christ. You need to be circumcised. Paul said you are fallen from grace. If you add one thing to it, Paul said, you have mutilated the doctrine, the gospel, and it is God's gospel. It's not yours. It's not mine. It's God's gospel. And if you mutilate God's gospel, God is going to deal with your case. Paul says, you know, I, I tell the story already. <clears throat> There are some Mormons who always camp out for me because they want to come talk to me. I mean, I'm not time come and reach home late. And they used to wait on me. And so one day I said, Chuck, let me not go hide them out. Let me get them a bligh. And I'm driving in and they are there waiting. So I said, gentlemen, I'm late. But I tell you what, come inside and sit down and let us talk. And I brought them in the house and them start to talk. Nice, you know, take out the Bible. And them reading the Bible. And then after they finish the Bible now, they take out another book. I said, what that? I said, oh, this is another book. I said, yeah, what, what that? I said, well, it's the Book of Mormon. I said, really? I said, who write it? Joseph Smith. So I said, all right, so what it's saying? And I said, well, you seem to have everything, you know. But the only thing you lack is that elders from the Mormon Presbytery must lay hands on you for you to receive the spirit. I say, elders from the Mormon Presbytery. So I turn to the same Galatians. I say, here is what Paul has to say about that. If I, Paul, or an angel from heaven, bring to you any other gospel than the one you received, let him be accursed. When I say, so I told him, I open big so. <laughs> Them jump up. I said, sit down, sit down, sit down. I said, him don't finish. And then him said, as I said before, let me say again. And me repeat it. Them jump up, take up them things. So I said, you want something to drink? Oh, no, we're busy with it. Them never come back to my house. Because the Mormon Jesus is Satan's twin brother. You don't know that. And his father have whole heap of children because he have whole heap of wife begetting children in heaven. Yeah, they don't tell you that when they come to your house. It's after you get in, you know that. And that's why you have to know the wolf. So they come to you. What Peter is saying here, they secretly, they don't come as heretics. They come as preachers. They come as teachers. They come as Lambs, but they are secretly ravening wolves. It, he says, these heresies are destructive because if you believe anything else, no matter how sincerely you believe it, if you believe it is faith plus works, and if you believe, like our Roman Catholic friends, that you can't really be saved or be sure of your salvation here because you will, you will commit venial sins even if you don't commit mortal sins. You have venial sins and you can't go to heaven with no venial sins because Jesus died for the sins that was past. Not for the one, no. When you sin, no, you have to do penance. You understand? And if you, you sin more than the penance that you do, you're going to purgatory to Pay for those venial sins until you purge all your sin in time to go to heaven. It may take a thousand years, it may take a million years, depending on how many venial sins you have. Let me tell you something. I have a, I think she won't get vexed if I say it. I have somebody I work with who born and grow an Adventist. That's another set of people. Say, oh, Adventist is our friend, man. It's just Saturday them worship, man. That's the only difference. And she went to Adventist college, everything. And she and her family go to an Adventist church. And she has been a diehard Adventist. And we were talking. 
And she come to me with the Sabbath issue and the investigative judgment issue. And I said, you know what? Let's turn to the book of Galatians. It's simpler to read than Romans. And by the time I reach halfway through, she started to hold her head. I said, let me ask you a question. And you know, when you start to pin people, them start to look for something to distract you, like the woman at the well with Jesus. You know, them tell us that we're supposed to worship over so and I start to buy out the argument. I said to her, do you have a certainty of your salvation? She said, when I ask my pastor that, he said, you can't certain of anything like that. You are telling you? Because their system is that you get saved by Jesus, but you enter heaven through works. Because the investigative judgment that started in 1844 is Jesus in heaven using a magnifying glass, looking on everything you do. And if you do something wrong, you mark it down. Because if you have anything, if you eat meat or you go eat pork, and hide and go do it. You can't come heaven. You hear what I'm telling you? So they live on a treadmill of works. Wearing out themselves. Poor souls. Never having any certainty of salvation. And you know what? She's now going to a missionary church. Near her. I give her a good church to go. She's going to a missionary church. And her family is going there now. And she called me and said. My sister in the States. I call her. And we read Galatians. And she said, the only thing my, our sister was saying is, oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> Just last week at work, she come bursting at the scenes and she said, my sister called me when I get ready for come work. And she said, you know, Sunday I went to church, which is an Adventist church in, in the States. And she said, from we read the thing, I sit down. After about 20 minutes, I had to get up and leave. I couldn't stay. You see, when you open people's eyes to the truth, they will be able to sift error. And when you know the truth, you can't sit down under the error. You're going to get miserable. And if it's your church, and it is some error that you think you can fix, work to fix it. Right? But Peter is saying, if you want... To fulfill the first chapter. Steadfastness. You have to be aware. Of the wolves. You have to be aware. Of heresies. And he says. Even denying. The master who bought them. Everybody. A lot of people have trouble with that statement. And I don't get too deep in it. Other than to say. When you look at what happened to Israel. In Israel, you remember when they came out of um, is Egypt, that from them come out, them start them golden calf thing, right? And them, them star that them carry with them, Remphan. And Moses said to them, you know, even to this time, God don't give you a heart to know him. Although him deliver on out of Egypt, although you see everything him do, on a heart still set upon the foreign gods. And the foreign life. Well, one of the things about heresies is that, and we have to, that's why I have to pray for leaders, you know. Because one of the things about heresy is this. It's not, it's not because all of them wicked. Some of them wicked because they know full well what they do and then plan it and then try to trick you. Like when Shelby Spawn came to Jamaica and everybody I gave him interview. Everybody I gave him interview. And I look at our pastor at the time and I say, why is everybody interviewing this man? And he said, why? I said, because he's a heretic. And he said, why you say that? He said, because me hear me two years on radio. He said, Jesus did not raise bodily from the dead. I said, if that is true, make me pack up with things and go home. And stop waste time at church. But everybody was, because he missed Shelby Spong, celebrated. Right? But he's a heretic. But he kind of spice it up. And tell you, you know, what we mean is that he rose spiritually. You know, just like all of us. All of us will rise spiritually. And so because he didn't rise, you know, 
physically. We don't have to expect him coming back physically. Yeah, that's what he said. Right? But, but, but although you have wicked people, a lot of people, they, they fall to the pressure of circumstance. And we, hope, we know how that's going on. Them say the higher monkey climb is the more I'm exposed, right? And what happens sometimes is, I don't know how many people now are listening to the big thing on the internet with, what the guy named Alistair Begg. Yes. Alistair Begg is a veteran preacher of, you know, good, good man, sound man, 40 years. But he shared something two weeks ago. He said, a grandma came to him and said, Pastor, my grandson is getting married, but he's getting married to a transvestite. What can I do? What should I do? And he says to him, he says to her, um, does your grandson know your stance? Does he know that you believe that you're Christian and that you, you follow what Jesus says? She said, yes. And he says, does your grandson know that that kind of thing is a sin in the Bible? And she said, yes, I tell him. And then he says, well, go to the wedding and carry a present. And a firestorm started on the internet. People saying, Alistair Begg need to repent or they need to kick him out of the church. Now, I spent a long time thinking about it. And, and, and I, I bring it up because I want to throw it on everybody. I know that you're going to say, well, ABC means that if you go, you are saying you are giving your approval. So I said to my wife, I know what he wants to do. I don't know if I agree with him, but I know what he wants to do. He wants to keep a relationship where he can have some kind of influence for good on them. So I said to, I said to Ingrid, Ingrid, suppose your son come back and tell you that he's living with a girl. You see, we, we, when we use the extreme case, like the transvestite thing, whistle, pumped up, it's easy to answer, right? But let me bring it down to the norm. Your son come and say, you know, I'm, I'm living with a girl. Um, and you say, what? Why are you living with a girl? If you feel that way about the girl, why don't you marry the girl? And he says, well, I'm not there yet, blah, 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 blah. And knowing me, she's not going to tell me, right? Because I'm going to say, come out of my house and don't come back until you're married to the girl. But, you know, you can't do that. You have to keep the relationship. So what will we do? Will we say, okay, you know what I feel about that? I don't approve of that, blah, 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 blah. Um, and I'm here for you if you need counseling. Because I think, you know, you and the girl need counseling. Now, when Christmas comes... Are you going to invite him and the girl to your Christmas dinner? That's my question. And I'd like some responses. Tell me if and why or why not. Are you going to invite him for Christmas dinner knowing that he's carrying the girl? It's like a catch-22 question, but um, you, you have your children, and they are adults, and, you, that, and this is my opinion. You teach them the way, you show them the way, but as a believer, would you want to alienate your children? Because I would invite them, because th there might be, here comes the opportunity that I can get to speak to them openly and speak to them about the be uh, my belief and what is, you know, what is expected and the right thing to do. So I would invite them to my Christmas dinner because this is an opportunity for me to share mm. and let them know what it was. Well, I I'm sure other people want to throw their 
to be seen. Hello. Yes. Yes, boss. Yes. Well, what she says, I, I, I would uh, really approve of what she's saying because it's really your, your kids and then if you get the opportunity, you could talk with them and you know, ask them to encourage them to, you know, do the right thing. Um, other than you just leave them astray and say, okay, um, you're, you're become an outcast because you're not doing certain stuff. And it is right for us to always um, entertain people so we can, you know, get them to do the right things because this is what God wants us to do, bring people to his, you know, his temple. So we have to make sure we are always ready to help them and speak with them and get them to do the right stuff. Mm. All right. I can, can I, can I? Yes, Lars. Um, okay, let me just say first that I, I, I have four children. And I always say, tell them my position as a Christian, how I would like to see things happen in my house. Mm -hmm. So they all know, and those who know me well know that that, that would, would never happen in my house. If, if they are big and they have a, a friend, girlfriend, boyfriend, you know, they are 14, whatever then they are welcome to, to come in the house, but not to stay in, the, not to live, so to, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But to answer the question, so that is well known. You know, they, 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 they know that, so that would not happen in the house. But if one of them, one of my child, for instance, chose to live, let's say, the concubinage life, as we call it here in Jamaica. And they are there out there. You mentioned about counseling. They know the principle. They, they know that, you know, it's not biblically sound based on our, our stance. But if they choose that, and here comes a family, they're not Christmas. Then, yes, I think it would be quite in order to, to invite them for them to come. If they choose to live that life, you know, on, on their own, mm -hmm. but I would not be, you know, uh, alienating them by not inviting them to family dinner because there comes a chance to, to you, you know, to, to, to show them again, to minister to them. Yeah. That, that's not right. All right. So, so, so here is why I ask the question. If you substitute the concubinage with a transvestite, would you invite them to the Christmas dinner? I'm not saying that you should have didn't invite the, the, the you, one you in know, country says, to the you, Christmas You know, dinner. it says entrapment you're going to do. No, I want people... Because you make people answer that first yes, question. Yes, and they, yes. Yes. I do it purposely. You know why? <laughs> I do it purposely because... Yeah, I come into your car. Because we tend, as I say, when something is a hot-button issue, we tend to react very unjudiciously without giving good thought. We go with our emotions. Now, after you think about it, you may still end up on the side, which many people do, say, me not invite them. For instance, the house I grew up in, <laughs> my father would not invite you if you were living in any concubinage. You're not coming into him house until him hear that thing straight. Now, my mother disagreed with him, world without end. World without end. However, because... He was the man of the house. She couldn't do it, make him sick, but she would reach out. You understand? But my father was very cut and dry when it come to those things. And he was not moving an inch. This would be even worse to the trans Yeah, and this wasn't transvestite, nothing. Testing. Maybe he would have taken up him hatchet and come look for you. You understand? <laughs> but but I'm, just, I'm not saying the right or wrong. And what I'm trying to show you is how some things can draw a line very thinly. And when people are in positions of authority, especially when I'm teaching, sometimes the world and what is going on out there brings so much pressure on them. And they are thinking, how the church is going to be relevant? How I can stay relevant? How, you know, all of those things. And I'm not making excuses now. I'm telling you how the thing works. And what they do is they move, which is what 
the word means. This is what heresy is. A move from orthodoxy. So they will shift on certain things because they have to accommodate the status quo. And they shift. But what happens with that shifting, invariably, it starts a precipitous ball rolling down the proverbial hill. Yeah. Uh, um, so, so my input would be, and you're emphasizing what I think um, we are to learn initially, that if we take our cue from the source, we won't go wrong. So example being, um, when the Pharisees wanted to stone the woman, and I think sometimes we read Jesus' experiences eventually instead of, instead of a prolonged approach right. that we should have. So we will read G the narrative of Jesus. They were so supposed to stone the woman. Jesus did this. But the lesson is that the church become that kind of a, 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 a space where Jesus' instruction to the woman was restorative while also giving her the position that he holds, which is not in conflict with one another. Right. And the tendency to either choose an extreme of, of abolishing and abandoning someone mm -hmm. for the sake of your upkeep or look mm -hmm. over against the, the hand of grace. Right. So your, your father and mother is, is playing two roles that the, church, that, ch that the church should have in both ends. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is like, in, interestingly, I was listening to a preacher and it, he was saying, if you take up stones, you can't say in the next instant that you're giving alms. is <laughs> 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 it's like, it's like the difficulty is the balance yeah. that I think, you know, if, if, if we're holding firm to the, to the principles of the word, we're, we're supposed to one take our cue from how Jesus would do, and at the same time, knowing where we remain grounded it, so that we don't deviate from the truth. So, I mean, it, it's the balance that I think yeah, is, so, is of most importance. So, so in the that. case of the transvestite wedding, I would not... I, uh, here's how I am splicing it. I wouldn't go to the wedding because weddings are a celebration, right? And so, and so I, I am going to be worried that I will give the wrong impression. Even though I want to remain or, or to retain the contact with them so that I can have some godly influence on them and hope for their salvation, um, I wouldn't do it at the wedding. I would say, I love you, but I'm not coming. However, if it is a dinner at my house, I may invite them. Because my, my, my reason for inviting them is like the woman who came in when Jesus was at the table and she came and put and break the alabaster box at his feet. It's a woman that everybody said, oh, know which kind, what kind of woman this? But he allowed her to do it because you have to give a door to sinners so that they can be saved. If you close the door, then what do they have? So I wouldn't go to the wedding, but perhaps I would have, if I was my dinner at my house, I would have said, um, all right, come, because in coming, I want to have a nice chat with them in the hopes to get the, in their heads so I can say, listen, <laughs> so, you know, you're, so, you're barking so, down the wrong tree. So, Elder, you give us, what, what's the word he was, he was giving us? What kind of questioning? <laughs> Entrapment. 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 So, so yeah. the question to you is, <laughs> do we go to the standpipe? <laughs> <laughs> Well, well here, here's, I, I slightly disagree. I'd, I, I think I'd go to the wedding because it's, it's not only celebration, but you're witnessing something. So I go and I say, all right, but I'm not staying. I'm not staying to no reception or whatever, whatever. You understand? Um, because I'm still concerned that... I want to leave the door open. Mm. You understand? But, but the, I think the bigger issue of all of this discussion is 
um, you know, it, it, we, we, um, we categorize these things, yeah? So where you started with um, the example of, of your son and inviting, we don't see that as big as the extreme right. of transvestite and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Yes. Right. And, um, and so that is where, uh, and that's where the emotions and you start get hot really? under the color. That's right. You understand? And, and so, uh, and, and we treat people in that regard and sin in that regard. Right. You know, where we, we say, oh, this is a little sin and this is a big sin. Right. And that sort of thing. That is. And, and, and so we're not getting at the fundamental issues of, you know, that which pleases God. Absolutely. Whether we see it as big or small or medium or whatever. Right. whatever. And, and, and as I was saying at the beginning, I'm going to come to you. As I was saying at the beginning, once you start the shift in the things that we think are innocuous, they tend to lead or open the doors to other things. And before we know it, we are standing way over there when we only, you know, intended to make one step. Which is, which is what the problem is with the church. Um, let me hear um, what you say. Elder, isn't, I'm thinking, isn't going to the wedding affirming that, it's all, that lifestyle is okay? Well, that's what I'm, what I'm trying to bring to your attention is that people will look at it differently. People will have a different view of the same issue. What is important is what they are trying to accomplish. He just said that what he's trying to accomplish is to keep the door of um, communication yeah, but open. You, but you can keep that door open without even going to the wedding. Well, because you it's may. Still, it's you may. Your, you may. It's still his grandson, and there will be other opportunities that you could talk to the grandson. You may. However, not going to the wedding just may drive the grandson and the transvestite away because transvestite may say to him, oh, I thought you, your mother and your father was Christian. I said, them hate you, and them go away. But it's a judgment call. That's what I'm getting at. Yeah. What I'm getting at is this. We need, to, we need to stay. You know, Paul said something that we mustn't exceed what is written. And I know it makes people angry because it is transvestite. We didn't feel so hot when it was shocking up. Because it's so common, we don't think about it. So we, we, never, we already push that one yes, as, as yeah. almost normal. But, but, <laughs> but we don't understand that where the society is now is as a result of the shocking up. Yes. You know, it's as a result of hugging that up 30 years ago. Yes. yes. Right? All of, the, you know, all of them fatherless children come from that mindset. Mm. We have done more damage to, an, to a, a generation by, you know... Overlooking those things. We have normalized those things. Yeah, and That's it's just because the church, when it's church, is something getting prevalent. Instead of saying, I don't care if I am not loved or liked, I'm going to tell you the truth. We don't say that. What we say is, how can we? Yeah, yeah, and, and, and that is it, Richard, because, because we have to get back to the fundamental teaching of the word of God. Because what has happened to us is that we rationalize it away. I remember preaching a message about that. That is how I started years ago. You know, um, and it was during a particular era. Because all of a sudden, some things that were black and white is now gray. Mm -hmm. Black and white based on the scripture. All of a sudden, it is now gray and we have enough argument over it and 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 that is what has happened with all these heresies that you talk about because as you as you in fact said that um, sometimes it is the leaders who in a subtle way whether whether um, intentionally intentionally are just wanting to be everybody's friend Bring in a little thing, and it veers away from the fundam fundamental teachings of the Word of God. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I, I want to say one thing, though. The, the example that you give with this grandmother, 
I don't think any of us can sit here and decide whether she should or should not. Because if we are speaking from the perspective of um, wanting to keep that door open, we don't, none of us know the dynamics. And all of us in here, when faced with that situation, if we are faced with that situation, the dynamics would be different. Mm -hmm. And it is within the dynamics that you now decide how, it, it, how it's going to impact if you just shut the door and say I'm not coming, or if you show up and that sort of thing. And also that you can, you're not necessarily saying you're supporting, but you're keeping the door open. Yeah, and as I say, it's kiddy because I can, in my own mind, say I'm not supporting, but, okay, put it this way. If it were a meeting of, say, not a transvestite wedding, suppose it was a meeting of, you know, people who decide that, hey, we are in this club of people who we believe in shocking up. Or, or we believe in some other deviant behavior. Anything else? Um, is going, is the, is, the, is the emphasis on keeping the door open going to be the realistic emphasis or is it going to be, well, look like giving a stamp of approval? Because, you know, um, well, we know this about church. The difficulty, especially church leadership, is that you mustn't just do what is right, but you must manifestly, undoubtedly be seen to do what is right. Because people's impression is like 90% of everything. And so it's a hard deal. So, 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 all right, before, let me hear what you're saying. Yes. Um, the singer Amy Grant had a niece who is on the other side, and Amy Grant supposedly is supposed to be a Christian singer, and she went to the niece's transvestite wedding and performed. So I'm saying if we continue the example you gave about the shocking up, and we allow it, so as leaders, as Christians, because we allow the shocking up then, we must allow the transvestite thing now, and then, so the slippery slope continues because we are constantly chipping away from the principles of God just so that we could fit in to society. That's not how we reach people for God. God does the convicting. And all we need to do is to just tell them the gospel and leave it at that, you know? Yeah, so... so that's so, my issue with it. And so no I grace. Hear, I hear... Let me hear. You, you, my, my caution, I hear all of what's happening, and I'm not excusing anything. Um, I go back to just as you're saying. So we're reading a book that within it said that the church is the foundation. Is The church is a... Is a is, holds the pillar of truth. Mm -hmm. So we're a truth-speaking um, entity. That's, that's, the, that's the point. And also, what we do must reflect and model the example of Christ. So, so if, the goal is, if the goal is to reach people, right, we must, I think, have a proper way of functioning. For example, um, I'm dealing with some, some students and the question was asked about how do we minister to the, the uh, this, I don't want to call them a community, but the, the new set of, what's, what's, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know, to, the, those, who are, those who are advancing an agenda. Mm -hmm. How do we minister the to them? Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. I think we have, not had, we have not processed a method because we already had a stance. And that stance is... No way, Jose. Is no way, Jose. 
And, and, and yeah, I get that. And we should have a stance, right? But my thing about it is I always try to see how Jesus did. For example, when you read Jesus' um, journey, it is showing us something, you know. It's showing us how he took on that mandate that he, that he spoke about, that pastor's um, yeah. Reverend White said on Sunday. And then how did he methodically set at liberty people who were poor, destitute? That's the example. And on the other side. And on the other side. How did he reach to the, gen the, 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 the other nations and stuff? Because first and foremost... If Jesus up, opposed the status quo, the status quo was if you're a Jew, you don't meddle with a Samaritan. Mm. You don't have friendship with the Gentiles who are those kinds of people. They serve other gods. They have other ideals and so on and mores. I think we exist now in a culture that is very amalgamated, full of immorality and stuff, but we don't have the or we are not springboarding of the example of Jesus. We will be opined to think on, on matters, but we're not taking our cue from... Yeah, it, uh, and, you, you know, as you are talking, I'm thinking of the same Jesus in Samaria thing. And what really reached out to me more than him just engaging the woman, because you can say, I can do an outreach to anybody, transvestite or any type. And because the outreach is sharing the gospel. But after Jesus spoke with the woman, he stayed two days in Samaria. No Jew stays in Samaria. Fine, so people that. may look on to him and say, you sleep there? <laughs> two days? No, man, you could never be who you say you are. You can't be Messiah at all. Right. So, so yeah, and, I get and what to you're hammer saying. Down, like, we, we, we have to remove... It's easy to have a preconceived thing, notion. So, so one of the things we must, we must accept, like Jesus did, using the same example, it is to bring people to a realization of what they exist for, which is to worship God. Yeah. <laughs> so so we, we, tend to, we tend to miss yeah, so, the, the, so the end. Yeah, I don't want to business. spend the rest of the night can on this something? one thing. I was just kind of provoking. Can I say something? Yeah. I'm going to ask you something. Um, what if those same kind of folks, right, decide to come to our church? Will you run them from the church? No. Huh? No, because... So, what, because so if you go there, then, um, what, what's the difference? I'm going to tell you what the difference to, is. Trying to um, go to um, get them to um, believe um, and change their, their concept All towards right. what they're doing. Uh, good question. Right? But he, here we is... have to remember that this church... Oh, yeah. Yeah. We have to remember that this church, every church mm -hmm. we, and that I know actually, is here to reform people. Yes, man. Right? So we, don't have, we have a lot of Christians here, yes? And we have other folks that come here that needs God, needs to change their mindset. And we have to uh, accept them. So yes. sometimes when we, we get so harsh about certain situations, I think we have to think twice before yeah, man. All right. I hear you. set the thing. But, but here, is, here is where I think the people who have a problem, where the problem lies. The problem is not that he wants to open the door for communication. They are thinking in their own minds that if a transvestite come to the door, what are we doing here? We're not celebrating transvestite-ism. Um, right. So when, when he it, when it come here, he's going to hear the word. And we are going to show him love so that he can know the genuineness of what he's hearing. And that if he puts his faith in Christ, he's going to receive the same love from us. Right? He needs to know that or she needs to know that. However, let, let me continue. In their minds, a wedding, why, why people have a wedding? People go to wedding as witnesses of an event, of a thing. The thing they're witnessing is a marriage, which is not a marriage, biblically, right? So their position is this. This is not a marriage. So if I go, I am telling them and people that I think it's a marriage. 
even though I disapprove of it. So, so it's, a, it's not as plain, cut dry as we make it out to be. Nevertheless, nevertheless, I say that to say, I started out with this point, that heresy has, or false teaching, is described in this passage in two major ways. One is a deviation from orthodoxy, and it's usually in an attempt to be accepted by the culture or to have traction with the culture, right? But the next thing in this passage is it comes in because whenever somebody who is a teacher has personal failure, if they do not come out of it quickly, repentantly, they begin to want to have a rationale for their lives. They provide a cover for their failures. And so they begin to soften on fundamentals. And that's what happens. And so that's what Peter is telling us here. It's a dangerous thing. A slippery slope, dangerous, because it's not just the person in danger. It's, it's everybody. You understand? And that's why Peter is, you know, notice Peter is not mincing words in this passage. He says, there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. And many will follow their sensuality. And because of them, the way of truth will be maligned. One of the things why appearances matter one of the things I was explaining to a member of this church, why when certain things happen in somebody's life, they slip, and it is public, why the church, once it is public, has a public restoration. Why? Because justice, or even grace, must not just be done, but it must be manifestly be seen to be done because it has an impact on those who are looking on. So Peter say, when these people get away, people follow it because look, we know how it go. If you are in a class at UA and when you don't bring in your paper upon time, the, the professor say, um, all right, bring it in next month. And you bring it in next month. After a while, you know, if you have three papers for do, you know which one you are the last? That one there. So that one always late because him opened the door. So what happened when we opened the door in church is that not only the teacher who is responsible slide, but other people say, but this is an easier way to live a Christian life. And when it says denying the Lord, do you know what it means? Do you know that there are a host of people now who will tell you that Jesus is their savior, but not the Lord? Mm. They refuse to make Jesus Lord. their Lord. And guess what? You can't make anything, you know, because he is the Lord, whether you like it or not. The word here for master is the word used for a slave owner. Jesus is the master. We don't like it. We are slaves. Paul used the term in his letter that I, Paul, you know, King James, nice it up. A bond servant. The word is doulos. It's a slave. When we come to faith in Christ, we leave the slavery of sin because we were slaves to sin and we now become slaves to Christ. But when the church begins to be filled with people who want to say, you know, I was looking at, you're talking about interviews. I was looking at some interviews. I'm interviewing stars. Like, uh, have this girl who is a camera by name, she, she dressed up in all kind of tight clothes and she's a rapper. Nikki. I don't know anything that she has done, but I saw her in an interview and the person, and she and person asked her if she's a Christian and she said Yes. <laughs> And she says she have a pastor and she talks to her pastor very frequently. And then she go and cuss her bad and do her rap and 
shake her behind and blah, blah, blah. Because the slippery slope starts. And who is going to corral themselves when you have space? You have space, you're moving out of space. And so Peter is warning us. Peter say, what is... All right, well, next week when we come, I will yeah. read further down. Next week. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Went to that church. Which right? church? Where these gamblers were gambling. The Could you imagine? All right, the temple, yeah, whatever. The temple. Could you imagine what would have happened if he had not gone there to change back what they have started? It, it has became a gambling house. And then he was so bold enough that he said, no, I'm not going to have this. And what him do? And he went there and he made sure this drop. All of that was going on. He created so a whip. Yes, yeah, so you're both party crushers. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so <laughs> when time you <laughs> got away with a man that they would feel foolishness, and you're going to go tell them your mind. You never really got it with, with, with a joy to say you, you come to um, accept what's going. You're but going, you know it's a wedding crash. You're going to <laughs> crush the wedding. <laughs> so it's a wedding crash. Huh? You understand? <laughs> so we have to understand that we can go places and do things. Yeah, man. In the name of God. Yeah. And we don't care what I agree you want to I agree with so you. So what other people want to no, think, no. they're going to think that, no, oh, man. this man is a no, wedding man. crusher. Yeah, man. Are but the pastor man? never tell a woman to crush a wedding. Him tell her to go and bring a big gift. <laughs> But I agree with you. I mean, you know, we want to do nice things. But we have to be careful of the message we send. Not just to the world. Because the world watching, you know. Every one of us know when we did get saved. That the people we used to run around with. Start to watch with close, 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 close. Because them are wait for your backslide. Them just are wait for you to do something. Say, yes, I know. Talk about you are Christian. All right, them are wait. So we have to be careful. And as we go on, we're going to see how much more grave the descriptions become as we go down in it. Really, really, really no hose barred as Peter comes down into it. Uh, we're going to rest there. One last right, thing. No, from no, you, you all right? For, <laughs> for, um, all right. So I don't know if, are there any announcements before we close off? Oh, yeah. Oh, Pastor had apologized because he's, he was in St. Elizabeth um, to administer to his mom. So he said I should share. Okay, that. so we, um, so we pray about keep him in prayer. that process. Yes. Any, any, anybody else? Anything else on the scope? No. All right, let's stand for prayer, please. You know, I want a new voice. Um, party crusher. Wedding crusher. <laughs> Come close for, in prayer for us. Dear God, we thank you for the lessons we have learned tonight and whatever thoughts that is in our mind, we have cleared them and we have come to conclusions to differentiate the good from the bad. Still, we are asking you, dear God, to encourage us each day so we might be mindful that there are things that can be done in your name and give us the strength to do these things so that others may be mindful and remembering that you are God and because of what we are doing, they are ready to accept you and to join us in the fight on this journey of making sure that we have more soldiers for this fight. And I ask you to guide us as we go our various places. Protect us. Be the driver. Give us the vision, the sight to see what obstacles come upon us that we may reach home safe. Amen. Sir? Yes. <laughs>